Coming up on Tech Things, Synology DS 1515 Plus. Just what is a NAS, anyhow? Email encryption, getting surround sound speakers set up right, dive flash, dive portable chargers, and more. It's all coming up on Tech Thing. Tech Thing is brought to you by viewers just like you. If you get something useful out of the show, please consider contributing at patreon.com slash tech thing. Thanks. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing, where we make technology behave. Except when it beats us half to death. <laughs> okay, usually we make it behave. Oh, whatever. <laughs> anyway, Windows 10. <laughs> You're caffeinated. I am. I think I forgot Coffee. to breakfast. Who knows what will happen. Windows 10 people, it's coming on July 29th. I know y'all have a lot of questions. Please send them to askatechthing.com because I have a meeting coming up with Microsoft and I will try to get every Ooh. question I can answered. It should be exciting. They're, they're like packing in new features. The, uh, the uh, 3D printing tool showed up in the last update. Oh, it's very cool. exciting for me. Very oh my exciting. gosh, okay. Uh, by the way, a great article showed up on Lifehacker. That's not unusual. Uh, I'll link to this in the show notes though. It is. Let me scroll to the top of the article so you can actually see it. How to configure <laughs> Windows 10 to protect your privacy. Um, it's really, really cool, actually, because it walks through, um, you know, everything from why you should start with a clean slate, uh, how you can remove your Microsoft account from 10 if you want to stay local, privacy settings, to things everybody should be doing on every version of Windows, like putting a lock screen on so that when you walk away from your uh, machine, yes. people can't step in and be like, oh, look. Shannon's email. <laughs> this How is exciting. so important. <gasps> Here's her mother's email address. Also, you know I'm really into hardware, of course, yes. like Raspberry Pis and things like that. So the BBC has revealed the final design of the Microbit, which is a pocket-sized computer set to be given out to about 1 million UK-based children in October. It looks really cute. It's very, very small. It's very similar to a mm -hmm. lot of those designs that I saw at Maker Faire. And uh, they basically say that you'll need a computer to program it, and it promises to work mm -hmm. with the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, and a ton of other devices. The BBC Director uh, General Tony Hall says that the microbit should help tackle the fact that children were leaving school knowing how to use computers but not how to program them. It's funny, this is not the first time the BBC has done a computer to help teach uh, computer literacy. It's really interesting, the board packs LEDs, buttons, apparently a magnetometer, a motion sensor. Yeah. And the idea, the original idea, they had a coin uh, slot type battery, a coin type battery on it so kids could do things and attach them to their clothes. Apparently, it's going to be using an external uh, battery, but it's really cool. I mean, yeah. there's just a lot of interesting stuff going on there. I agree. It's um, very, very small, easily portable, and it looks like it would be very fun to program. So I love yeah. that they're doing this for kids, and I wish we had this when I was a little one. Well, it's funny. We're actually teaching <clears throat> Seamus how to program. That's one of the things we're working with him this year. Aww. So we'll talk about we'll talk about <laughs> Scratch and some other stuff later on. But yeah, you'll apparently you'll need a computer to program it. Yep. It'll work with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis, and children just look thrilled. Yes, they do. So just <laughs> micro USB power jack. Mm. I'm just gonna segue as gracelessly as possible. Back up your data. As usual. Oh my goodness, we tell you this all the time. You can use a thumb drive, an external USB drive. Services like CrashPlan are great for the one-off site in the three, two, one three, backup two, idea. One. Three copies of your data on two different media, yep. at least one off-site. Um, attaching a USB drive to your router uh, was pretty easy, but given the net USB vulnerability that popped up back in May, you probably don't want to be doing that unless A, your router isn't on the list of, well, the routers with net USB that aren't getting upgraded, <laughs> or B, has actually had an update. Yes. Um, and look, while well, dropping a USB hard drive on the network is cheap and easy, if that drive goes, <laughs> so does your data. No! So this, is a Synology DS 1515 Plus. This oh, is a so dedicated heavy. NAS. Na, well, this is a dedicated NAS box or network detached storage. This is a big step up. Uh, my buddy Alan Malvantano, PC Pro Storage Maven, he's a big fan of Synology. Uh, we've used him here at the Hack House. I've used him. Um, we've talked a lot about NAS and NAS boxes uh, with more than two drives. This one has five drives, and the wow. idea is that drive dies. You can pull the dead drive out and put the new drive in. Six terabytes. It's so glorious. That's pretty sweet. Two drive NAS boxes are cool. Um, they are a big step up from a single drive because a single NAS or a, a two NAS bay, basically mm -hmm. they do mirroring and if one drive dies, all of your data is still on the other drive and you can put a second drive in and copy your data back up. Cool. So a multiple drive NAS bay like this DS1515 uh, can use RAID, RAID 5, so it's using parity data to protect you from data loss in the case you lose a drive. And it, it, take a look at this RAID calculator. So they also have Synology's hybrid RAID. It's like a modified Linux RAID that's designed to minimize lost drive space. 
uh, or take advantage of reserved space. Generally speaking, like this is with you know six four terabyte drives. Generally speaking, you know you get a subset of that space. They have to reserve some space to protect your data. Mm -hmm. So in this case, like I've I've mocked up four uh, five four terabyte drives, and I've got sixteen terabytes of space. Wow! Uh, not uh, for storage, not twenty terabytes of space for storage. Um, you know, it's you know you can configure it depending on how you set this up. Mm -hmm. You can set it up so that if one drive or two drives die, you can drop in a fresh one and rebuild it. So, you know, in case it's not too obvious, all NAS boxes are essentially computers. This DS1515 Plus has a quad-core CPU with two gigabytes of RAM. There's hardware encryption, so you can encrypt everything on the fly without slowing down your speeds. Um, if you add a pair of DX513 boxes onto this, you can do 90 terabytes of storage. Jeez. Yeah, there's about 21 terabytes of storage in this right now with, oh with six gigabyte drives. It's pretty badass. <laughs> This is a, a small to medium office server, essentially. It can be upgraded to six gigabytes of RAM. That's the primary difference between this and the DS1515. I'm gonna say I doubt most home users would need the extra RAM. Probably not. But in a business environment with high loads, it would probably get really useful. Mm -hmm. So this is the DSM software they use to manage. It's essentially, I'm looking right now at the operating system on the box via web interface. You manage it, you monitor it, you would add packages like media servers to it if you wanted to stream to your home theater or run an email server. And it's pretty crazy. It's essentially a Linux box. And oh look, we've got CloudStation, CloudSync, Drupal. Um, uh, let's cool. Go. Well, yeah, I mean, under the multimedia section here, the iTunes server, their basic you know, DLNA media server, Plex. Um, I could go on on this for a while. These are really sophisticated tools for dealing with data and mm -hmm. distributing data. You know, I have a media collection. Yeah, I have absolutely. like 125 ripped Blu-rays plus, you know, 900 ripped CDs. I can keep that on a single drive or a couple of three drives in a computer, but then I have to worry about backing the data up. Yep. We'll talk more about that later. Um, we use a DS1813 here in the Hack House. It's one of the previous versions uh, of a, a big 8-bay NAS drive from it's Synology. It's amazing. It is amazing. <laughs> Backups, video editing, storage. Um, lots and lots of storage. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of what NAS boxes all, are all about. Mm -hmm. The DS1515 Plus is fast. Synology says you're, you can have up to 450 megabyte per second reads and 400 megabyte per second writes. Here's the deal though, if you're connected over a gigabit network and you probably are at home, you're looking at just over like 100, 105 yeah. megabytes per second because That's gigabit awesome. <laughs> is between you and the box. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny, but if you look at this, right, you know, there's eSATA ports, there's USB ports for, for you know loading files. There's also four, uh, uh, Ethernet jacks on the back of this. So you can do- <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so you can do failover on a network load balancing. At $770 without drives, the DS1515 uh, Plus is probably a bit much for the average home network. Mm -hmm. It is very business and security, security, security. You'd think. After. Yay encryption! Yay encryption! <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's it it is a badass box for people who really want to protect data. Um, for most home users, like a DS four one five Play, which is the one that's up here on the screen right now, that's five hundred dollars, or a DS four one four Slim would probably be a more appropriate choice. This one ah, starts at yeah. three hundred dollars. Um, you know, for basic backups, keeping your terabytes of ripped Blu-rays available on the home network, your audio collection, your billion podcasts, because I know you're downloading. <laughs> thing, right? Um, you know, you could build a NAS yourself on PC hardware. Free NAS, uh, you know, we did a, a die try and build on that. It was the first die try and episode. It's essentially enterprise grade, big iron storage operating system, um, but configuring it is a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Unraid 6 looks really interesting, a lot simpler to configure than FreeNAS, has some really interesting features, including some really interesting VM plays, but I haven't had a chance to install and run that yet. Uh, we'll talk more about NAS soon. I would love to have any of your questions about NAS boxes and home storage. Fire them out to askatechthing.com or, uh, you know, at Patrick Norton or at TechThing or at... <laughs> just, at Snubs. <laughs> I can't remember if it was Snubs or Snubsy. I also got one of Synology's new uh, Beyond Clouds in, so I'll be discussing that on the show yeah. pretty soon, too. Yeah. Yay. If It'll it's, be fun. If, if you're not, it's just, if you're not backing up data... <laughs> just, just do it. Just do it. We'll talk more. <laughs> Darren, what's going on on Hack 5? Hey Patrick, we're building out some rootin' tootin' good virtual servers with free open source software plus sniffing packets on Androids. It couldn't be easier. Check it out, HAK5 and all the other good shows over at hack5.org.
It's time for this week's rapid fire roundup, which is completely inspired by Patrick's wiring the warehouse screen for surround sound. So we're talking about three, almost two, three different things to think about before you buy and install surround sound speakers. Are you ready? Yes. Yes, go. All right, first of all, how are you going to mount them? There's a couple things to think about here. For example, take a look at these Pioneer Andrew Jones 5.1 home theater speaker pack. These, Ooh. this is a badass setup. Um, but these are also floor standing speakers. And it may sound silly, but before you buy this, figure out if you can properly position these. The same goes if you're going for something uh, a little more affordable, the Tate Classic 5.1. That should look like an expanded picture, but it doesn't. Um, <laughs> the Tate Classic 5.1. Uh, is super popular, sells for about 400 bucks. And in-wall speakers are getting amazingly good for the money. Yeah. They are spectacular. You also have to be able to cut a hole in the wall. Here's the thing, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about floor standing, bookshelf speakers, or in-wall speakers, you want to take a look at something like Dolby's speaker placement guides. Mm. You know, the center channel is pretty obvious, but you want to make sure you actually array the speakers in the proper place, and especially the rear surround sound speakers. If you don't put them in the right place, things aren't going to sound right, mm -hmm. and well, we'll talk about calibrating them later on. Um, and also, by the way, are you going 5.1, are you going 7.1, are you going Atmos? All of these offer additional speaker options that you may want to think about before you start spending your money on speakers. Two. This is a big one. Where <laughs> and how are you going to run the cables? Ah, uh, yes. In my house, it's easy. I drilled a hole in the wall, I drilled a hole through the wall down to the crawl space, I pulled the cable, and I used lots of cable timeouts. If you need to run them through a room, there's the whole, what Lloyd Case used to call the spousal acceptance factor. <laughs> um, and you laugh, but... You oh, know, it's so true. Yeah, you know, this, these, these right here, the thing I'm looking at, these are cable runs. That might be a way to do it. You might mm -hmm. be able to hide it under the baseboard. There are some pretty slick, what they call corner ducts that go up around the ceiling. You can paint over those and make them hide. If you have, you know, throw rugs, you may be able to wire them under the rug. But you should really think about the fact that if I have a television here and my AVR is here, I'm going to need to get wires here and there and all the way in the back. And if it's a 7.1, there's two sets all the way in the back. So mm -hmm. figure out how you're going to run them through the room. And cable ties are your friends. The stick-on ones will eventually fall off, I am convinced. I prefer the ones that allow you to screw them into the <laughs> wall or the stud or the frame. Um, especially if you're running them down in the basement or up in the attic. Do yourself a favor, tie those things down. Good point. Just saying. Finally, so you've got the speakers placed, mm -hmm. you've got your wiring set up. Everything's running, it's connected to your AVR. Let's talk about tuning and configuring. This can ah. be as simple as using a dB meter with test tones from a setup DVD or Blu-ray, or using the microphone for the Odyssey or whatever the manufacturer's automated setup software is. But it is critical to tune your surround sound system, basically the levels from each speaker, left, right, center, and the rear, so the surround sound speakers or the Atmos, once your system is installed and in place. Because if you don't, you're not going to get the full surround sound effect, or it may sound really weird. My personal favorite, somebody had uh, their surround sound system set up, and they are like, I can't really hear anybody talking. Oh. Uh, that's because their center speaker was turned down to two. <gasps> Uh, oh no! <laughs> yeah, well everything else was up around 40. Sounds ridiculous, <laughs> but it happens. Mm -hmm. Take the time to configure. Like, you know, if you want to get fancy, you can get a dB meter. Audio Gurus has some great setup guides. Um, oh, cool. I've done it both ways, manually with a dB meter. I gotta say, I think a lot of the new automated setups that are included in inexpensive uh, AVRs are really worth using. Odyssey started uh, making it very popular. Now a lot of the major manufacturers do their own version. Basically, there'll be a microphone in the box. You put the microphone in the sweet spot, you run the settings. In some cases, they'll let them do it like all of the seating locations where people watch the oh, movies cool. so you can sort of balance the overall impact. Um, but take your time to set things up. Got I some... agree. <laughs> it's very, agree? very important. Well, it is. And we're going to have monster sound in the warehouse. <laughs> Yatta! I want to know what your picks are. You can email us, ask at techthing.com. And while we are talking all about speakers for TVs, I wanted to check out a question from Steve, who emailed us. We have finally moved into our new house and are setting up the bedroom TV. My wife would like to have speakers for the TV, but wants the placement to be over by the head of the bed. The TV is on the opposite wall. We used to use our Roku 3 remote with the headphone jack, but man, that eats batteries like no tomorrow. I'd rather avoid headphones altogether as conversation is always a good thing. Any advice on gear to accomplish this? Thanks in advance and regards, Steve from Dayton, Ohio. Thank you. Oh man, you could go nuts, do wireless speakers. Like, you know, Audio Engine makes some oh, yeah. fantastic speakers. Uh, you know, put one of these each, like the, you know, the A5s or the A2 on the nightstand. It would be pretty crazy and awesome. <laughs> um, but here's the thing, right? 
TV audio, especially conversations, sound really weird because you're looking at the screen mm -hmm. and the conversation's coming from here, left and right. Good point. And by the way, the audio is going to be right next to your heads, which sounds really good, except for the whole disorienting spatial thing. Uh, it, when it, it, you know, Because basically, like, if you can get over the fact that it's not on the screen, mm -hmm. there's still two additional problems. One, it interrupts your conversation because it's right by your heads. And two, um, will wake you up when your spouse is watching John Wick at 2 in the morning. <laughs> Here's what I would suggest you do instead. Wirecutter has a fantastic article on the best budget soundbar uh, or high-end soundbars. Get a soundbar. Yes. They take up almost no space. They get the audio over to where the television, where it should be. They do not, they just, they just, they tuck under the television. You can use it with the subwoofer in a corner. You can hide it. They sound fantastic and it's just easy. Just, it's just easy. I use a soundbar. It's yeah. amazing and it was super cheap on Amazon. Yeah. It's a good thing. Mm-hmm. You should get one. It's fine. <laughs> it is now time for our HostGator Disruptive Tech of the Week. And I want to talk all about PGP. Are you familiar, sir? Pretty good privacy? That's right. I remember the PGP wars back where you... I just, like, all of it. When I was a baby. A baby. <laughs> it's this open protocol that lets you encrypt data from point A right. all the way over to point B. And people use it for email a ton. At mm -hmm. least, well, I do. Pretty good privacy is pretty the awesome. Geeks. <laughs> if you used PGP, you would have a private key and a public key. People would use the public key to send you all sorts of messages by just verifying that you are who you are with your public key. And then you would use your private key to encrypt or decrypt those messages or send out your own encrypted messages with their public key. So I wanted to introduce a few different PGP concepts and options for you guys that are really easy to use. See, the problem is that the absolute best way to encrypt your email with open PGP, which is the open standard, is just to roll your own service. But that could be kind of complicated. Emotionally traumatizing. <laughs> it could. It could take a long time, too, for a lot of folks, including myself. So I've tested a bunch of different email encryption services to see what was best, in my opinion. Now, one of my favorites is this website called Keybase.io. It's an open source command line tool as well as a website. So you would use it to verify people's identities before sending them messages, and then you could check their public key and send them encrypted messages. So if I wanted to, I could log into my page, and I could choose to encrypt a message right here, and I could choose my recipient, say I could send a message to Darren Kitchen if I wanted to. Let's see where he is. There he is. He's already been verified with his public key on the website, and I could say, hey man, what's up? <laughs> Sign the message with my passphrase. Glad you secured that incredibly sensitive message. Yeah, I know. It's very, very important. <laughs> Sign encrypt, and then it encrypts the messages, message. I can then use my email address to send that over to him, and he can decrypt the message through Keybase as well. It's, of course, still in beta, though, so it's invite only. You will have to know somebody who already has invites available. Available. I don't have any at the moment, so I'm really sorry. But there are plenty of people on Twitter and Facebook that do have uh, Keybase invites available if you're interested. Uh, the second one I wanted to check out as well, and I've reviewed this on several different shows. It's called Mailvelope. This is another option if you're just worried about email and not so much random messages. It's also open source and it's a really simple browser extension for Chrome and Firefox as well. Hmm. This one's probably the easiest to set up, I think, because it's just a Chrome extension. But I've done walkthroughs on both on Hack5, so you can check that out. And you can find Mailvelope over at mailvelope.com. And lastly, and this is actually an email that we got from Paul. Paul, who mentioned Pro Mail. He says, hi, great show, guys. I found you from Hack5 and now watch both shows every single week. I thought I would like to check out Proton Mail at protonmail.ch. It's a secure mail service that has some really smart people behind it and connections to CERN, hence the name Proton Mail. <laughs> it's free, it's secure, developing fast, and based in Switzerland, which says a lot about its attitude to privacy. From Paul. So we should point out when when you when you put servers in a country like Switzerland, it basically will require forever yes. to fight through the courts for someone to try to legally access <laughs> your mail. They're pretty much all about privacy over there in Switzerland. You guys are cool. Yeah. So I checked out this one too. It's a little bit different in that you'd be using their site to sign in. So I would be I would sign in here and then choose snubs at protonmail.com or something with my password. Sign in and then I could check my mail. I'm currently on the waiting list for this one, so I haven't been able to review it yet. It is free though, and I checked out their security features. They do mention, hey, Swiss base, because that's amazing. And then if you scroll down, they are an open PGP alliance source. So 
they do state all cryptographic libraries that they use are open source as well. Of course, if you guys have any ideas, any useful security platforms that you want to introduce to everybody, you want to help people secure their emails, you need a place to host it on too. Isn't that right? And you should host it on our sponsor, HostGator.com. If you use the coupon code TechThing, you'll score 30% off any new hosting package and you yes. support the show. Thank you so much. Check it out. Joe says, I watched the show when you went back to Firefox. I use Firefox, but also Waterfox and Cyberfox and Pale Moon 64-bit browsers. So far, I like Cyberfox and Waterfox. The only problem that I have is that Waterfox has a problem with Adobe Flash Player sometimes. I would like to know, are 64-bit browsers better than 32-bit browsers? They seem to be, but Firefox is fast too. So are 64-bit browsers good things or bad things? And is there a Firefox and Chrome 64-bit browser? Joe. Yeah. Uh, so first off, you mentioned that you were using Flash. So I would say disable Flash. <laughs> I know you probably didn't want to hear that, but it's an old school nuisance. There, there's this hilarious site, which is pretty legit. It's called OccupyFlash.org, and they discuss the reasons why you want to get rid of it and how to basically use other things instead, like HTML, uh, HTML5 instead. Uh, and then on your question about 64-bit browsers, yes, there are versions of Firefox and Chrome in 64-bit, and they are very much stable. Woohoo! Now, if you have a upgraded, you probably not see a huge difference, but they are better. Check out 7tutorials.com. They did a whole breakdown of Google Chrome 64-bit and is it better than the 32-bit version. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of charts on here that go through different things like watching videos, playing games, using Flash, things like that. But once you get down to the bottom, that's where the important part comes. Is it actually better? 64-bit version uh, has improved speed when dealing with graphics and audio. There's about a 15% improvement in and decoding performance, so increased performance to overall is 25%, better security with high entropy ASLR, and then improved stability. So basically they say it's about 50% mm -hmm. better as far as crash rates go than the 32-bit version of Google Chrome. So definitely better, but you have to be one of those hardcore people that are playing video games a lot in your browser and uh, you know watching a lot of Netflix and Hulu and things like that to really see a stability difference. Well, we're running 150 tabs while watching Netflix. <laughs> yes. By the way, um, it's been interesting. We talked about it a bunch on ThreatWire, which you can find on youtube.com slash hack5, um, which is um, We've been talking a lot about Flash. There's been a, a couple yes. of pretty nasty flash holes. Another one was just uncovered uh, in the the hack team. Is it hack team? The Italian hacking group? team. The hacking team. Hacking team's secret data that got exposed revealed another at this up to that point unknown uh, flash security issue. Flash is being updated constantly. The one that's built into Chrome is is generally speaking much better than the one that you install mm -hmm. for your other browsers. But if you're ready to get Flash completely, which I am in the process of doing, do yourself a favor. Go into Chrome. Type in Chrome colon slash slash plugins. And that will tell you all the plugins that are running on your system. And all you gotta do is go to here and click <laughs> It's disable. super tiny, but he's going to Adobe Flash Player and clicking disable underneath it. And now Flash will no longer run inside of Chrome. Yay! Which may break your heart if you have that, you know, hamster dance web page in Flash you can't live without, but generally speaking is a good idea, I think, for security and mm -hmm. for efficiency on your machine. And hey, if you didn't know, we have a Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash tech thing where we look at questions from you guys as well. Uh, Daniel asked Posting over on news Facebook. Stories there now. Yeah, we do have news stories over there, and we've been uploading videos as we can. So mm -hmm. Daniel asked over on Facebook, which portable battery is, in your opinion, the best for charging tablets and smartphones? I'm planning a 16 to 24 hour trip. Notice you tend to use portable batteries a lot. I'm hoping to spend 60 bucks with 20,000 mAh capacity. That's milliamp per hour. Thanks from Dan. 20,000 milliamp hour batteries. That's a are, lot. Yeah, they're they're extremely uncommon. Uh, they're very, very rare. I've owned yeah. a 19,000 milliamp hour battery. Um, this is the Pineapple Juice 15,000, uh, and this is the inside of the Pineapple Juice 15,000, <laughs> which is pretty typical for a battery, except it's much larger than most of them. Essentially, there are batteries, and there is the controller that deals with the USB charging, letting you know what the power level is, and of course, the USB output. Um, these are generally optimized uh, for charging or charging to be able to detect the amount of charging your phone will handle mm -hmm. and then jack it up the most ways. Um, I pretty much live with uh, Anchor's portable batteries at this point. Yeah, this is their 12,000 milliamp hour battery. Um, they have a good return policy too on those. Yeah, I actually had to use it once. I had one that died and they were super cool about it. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, they go up to, I want to say the second gen Astros, this is 12,800 milliamp hours now. That is a pretty badass battery and you can charge up to three devices simultaneously. Um, I really like the Anchor and if you're just looking for general Amazon recommendations, I've heard good things about Anchor, PowerAd, and Kamashi and RavPower. These are kind of all the top manufacturers. They're pretty much all coming out of China and they all pretty much do a solid job. <laughs> And from Manny, he said, hi folks, just a small question. Is there a short or not too complex way to export the password stored in the OS X keychain to a CSV file or something else? Greets from Manny. So this is uh, sort of, <laughs> it's, it is a bit complex. If you really want to do it. <laughs> if you really want to do it, it is possible. Yeah. So there are directions over on GitHub, which basically says exactly what you wanted, exporting iCloud keychain and Safari credentials to a CSV file. Uh, so you basically have to go through quite a few steps here and use a little bit of code. But if you're not too scared to use that, then you should be fine. Um, basically at the end, you end up with a CSV file of all your different passwords and usernames and you won't have to type them in separately each time. You're essentially running a script against the keychain that grabs like enters the data, grabs the data and then pulls it out. Pretty much. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, but it's possible, it's apparently. <laughs> I don't have a Mac that I can use this on and test it, so let me know if that works for you. I also wanted to mention, if you're just looking to transfer your keychain from one Mac to another, uh, if that is what you're looking for, the steps are a lot easier. So you can just go over to OSX, or OS X Daily, sorry guys, uh, copy the keychain logins and passwords from one Mac to another is the article. Uh, there's just a simply four different steps that you have to go to, and then you're good to go. Yay! Yay! Yeah, pretty cool. Ashley asked on our Facebook page, Patrick, have you tried using the glue stick on your 3D printer bed? Most people find it to work well and you avoid overspray on your printer. Also, <laughs> how are you finding 3D printing? I'm loving mine. That um, is funny. I actually have a, a little... Glue stick. I, well, I, glue stick's cool. Uh, I actually have a little sort of cardboard doodad I made that keeps me from having overspray issues oh. with hairspray. My problem uh, has nothing to do with getting things to stick to the surface. It's a bunch of issues in the firmware and getting it to update properly on this mm -hmm. particular brand of machine. Uh, when 3D printing works, I think it is the most amazing thing ever. When, it, when doesn't, it doesn't work, we want to kill it with fire. Yes, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we should tell them about Patreon. Patreon.com slash tech thing if you love the show. And if you want to see us start doing actual full physical builds, long, expansive DIY hands-on stuff, like maybe we'll build an under 86. Maybe we'll build something Ooh. crazy with a Raspberry Pi. Maybe we'll rebuild my gaming machine. Maybe we'll build a gaming machine and give it away. But to do that, we got to hit $2,500 an episode. And to do that, we hope you will go to Patreon.com slash tech thing and subscribe to help support the show and keep it coming to you every We are so close. Thank you. So close. So close. And remember, guys, I know we say this during every single episode, but it really, really helps me, you know, to get back away from the technology sometimes, because sometimes you're in front of a screen way too much. 12, so, 15 hours a day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so just put down your phone, step away from your computer, close the laptop screen, just do something analog. It's summertime, so I vote we go on a picnic. Picnic. I want to do a picnic. Barbecue. I need to get a picnic basket. No. So let's go shopping, too. I'm not gonna let no picnic baskets. <laughs> there was an incident when I was a child. No picnic basket. No. No? Okay. <laughs> picnic basket failures are epic and traumatic for small children. <laughs> I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Thing. Windows 10 is almost here. Do da, do da. Windows 10 is almost here. The scent of hate is coming off of snubs. At least it smells good. Like perfume. Shannon's hate smells like roses and cotton candy. <laughs> In any case, don't cut all of that part out. <laughs> we want to thank everyone. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Patreon team. Arigato. Because you keep the show. Domo arigato gozaimashita. Whatever that means, it sounded awesome. I'll just go wadi wadi wadi. Oh, that, oh, don't go, Tama. I gotta take all the drives. I know, it's just. I gotta do it. Well, at least the drives are easy to take out. No, they came that way. <laughs> Although, I'd be honest with you, um, the nice thing about having them be lockable is can you imagine, like, the three year old discovering like, things that they can. I mean, I can. <laughs> Vividly. Look at all.
Once you've cleaned the peanut butter off of the monitor, you just start thinking entirely differently. <laughs> Fans are replaceable too. Replaceable fans. Replaceable <laughs> fans. I oh, just burped. Ethan. Ethan. USB. Power. Can we make that our Power. our screen capture for this week? Here. 